thank you for your patience while we were getting a few details worked out here this evening. Welcome to the Salem City Council and to our Urban Renewal Agency meeting. Um, I would ask that uh, I will open the meeting and ask for a roll call. Board Member Bennett is, is absent and sitting in for him tonight is guest board member Rebecca Engel. Board Member Tesler? Present. Board Member Nanke? Here. Board Member Clausen? Here. Board Member Dickey? Here. Board Member Thomas? Here. Board Member Blazy? Here. Board Member Clem? Here. Chair Peterson? Here. Thank you. We have special guests this evening. Uh, two members of the Boy Scout troop from South Salem are here with us this evening to observe our council meeting, and I've invited them to please come up and help us to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Boys. I mean the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, with Member Bennett away, we actually do have a presiding officer assisting me, and that's Brad Nanke, Member Brad Nanke. So, uh, Mr. Nanke, Councillor Nanke, would you please um, approve the special meeting, move to approve the special meeting <coughs> agenda? I would, as a board member. Yes, um, as a board member, thank you. Madam Chair, I would move the. Uh, Approval of the special meeting agenda for the Urban Renewal Agency September 24th meeting. Second. It's been moved by Member Nanke and, sec and seconded by Member Clausen. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We have one individual signed up for public comment this evening, Pete Dane has signed up. Mr. Dane, please come to the microphone. You have three minutes. And introduce yourself. At the end of two minutes, the amber light comes on. And at the end of three minutes, the red light comes on. Oh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Peter Dane. I live at 720 Capitol Street in uh, the Northeast neighborhood. And the article in today's uh, Mid Valley section on the uh, Glen Creek Trail caught my attention and I thought that uh, it'd be good to speak up and uh, call attention that the trail is a uh, wonderful project and makes for a more sustainable environment, but the uh, cost seems suspect and doesn't make for a sustainable economy. And I'd encourage the city to uh, pay closer attention to their design and bidding process in the future on projects like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council members, uh, board members? Member Clem. Thank you, um, board member Peterson. Um, <laughs> Mr. Dane, are you, are you aware that uh, we've had a couple of stops and starts on this project and a lot of the complexity and costs is due to uh, a number of additional studies and requirements by use of federal funding. So I will tell you that this issue has been raised in front of council a couple of times before. And uh, just wanted to make you aware that uh, we, uh, in the future, will be looking differently at uh, accepting federal funding just simply because there are tremendous more requirements. It would have been neat just to build a trail from here to there, but it got real complex uh, when we used federal dollars. Yeah, I you have to follow the, follow the guidelines and yep. just the cost of doing business, but it just seems ironic that the cost is probably more than what it took to construct the Union Street Bridge a long time ago. Yeah, it's not that much, but <laughs> your point's well made. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Member Nanke, would you like to make a motion on action items? Uh, 
Madam Chair, on the uh, the three action items, Councillor Dickey will be making the motion on the first item, our uh, board member uh, Dickey on the first item, board member Tesler on the second, and since uh, member Bennett isn't here, uh, board member Clem agreed to uh, do the motion on the third action item. Oh, all right, thank you. Then we'll move to action item 4A, uh, Member Dickey. Yeah, I'm gonna move staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Member Dickey and seconded by Member, I didn't see who did that, Nanke. Is there discussion? Yes, Councillor Dickey. Yeah, I just, um, I have a couple questions for staff um, on this issue. This is a du jour loan to, um, from North Gateway redevelopment um, area to the West Salem um, urban renewal area. And my questions are, first of all, um, did the North Gateway redevelopment advisory board have an opportunity to discuss this? Um, were they given the information? Um, and my second question is, um, what's the certainty that the loan would get repaid with in the time frame specified in the staff report. Okay, um, John Wales, our Director of Urban Development. Um, yes, Councilor Dickey, the um, North Gateway Advisory Board, what, this was discussed, I think, at their August 2nd meeting. Um, and we were we had laid out the, the information of that, uh, the, the, the funding in, um, in West Salem for their, um, for their projects was having a cash, we had a cash flow issue. And so we discussed Couple, various options that we had considered, and the, the best one seemed to be a loan from North Gateway to, to West Salem, a temporary loan. At the time, back in August, we thought that um, for sure we would, be, we would be paying this back by uh, March of 2013. We now think, in fact, we'll be paying it back by December 31st of this year. And the reason is that we will have collected the tax revenues for the, the URA in West Salem by, in November. And by the end of the year, we, we believe uh, very confidently that we can, we can pay it back in that time frame. And so we had shared that um, with the, with the um, uh, advisory board at, at that time. All right. It's been moved and seconded to um, accept staff recommendation. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. And on item 4B, Member Tesler. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move staff recommendation. Okay. It's been moved by Member Tesler and seconded by Member Nanke to move staff recommendation. Is there discussion? Member uh, Tesler. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Uh, it says here that uh, this, the three parcels are acquired at various times for the purpose of providing green belts of open space. Uh, are we going to continue with that usage pattern? Uh, John Wales, Urban Development. Yes, uh, Councillor. The um, the parcels have to be used for the same purpose that um, are, that were they were acquired under and what they required under the URA plan. And so, in order for any other use to occur there, they would have to conform with the with the current use. Okay. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you. It's been moved by uh, Member Tesler and seconded by Member Nanke. All those in favor of the Staff recommendation of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries, thank you. And on item 4C, uh, Member Clem. Thank you, you Madam Mayor. Um, yes, I move staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by, count by Member Clem and seconded by Member... Tom. Think Tesler. Tesler? All right, there we go. If I'm not looking up, I sometimes can't <laughs> tell which side of the room that's coming from. All right, is there discussion? <coughs> Member Clem. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, I, I appreciate staff's uh, innovation here, and I'll obviously uh, appreciate the cooperation that we have between the wards and the parts of town to loan each other money when we've got short-term needs, and at an interest rate much lower, or at least lower than what uh, du jour borrowing, which is commonplace for governments to do. So uh, the, borrow, the loaning here is actually saving money over what we've traditionally done, and that's gone to the marketplace. So uh, appreciate the creativity, and we'll pay you back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any further discussion? 
We'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. I see no further business to come before our Urban Renewal Agency Board, so this meeting will be adjourned. This will now open the City Council meeting for September 24th. Would the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Bennett is absent and sitting in for him tonight is guest Councillor Rebecca Engel. Councillor Tesler? Present. Councillor Nanke? Here. Councillor Clausen? Here. Councillor Dickey? Here. Councillor Thomas? Here. Councillor Blasey? Here. Councillor Clem? Here. Mayor Peterson? Here. Thank you. I have a proclamation this evening that I'm very pleased to present and I wonder if Ray Burstead would please join me for the proclamation. my pleasure is this on is this my is my pleasure to welcome Ray Burstead this evening to receive this proclamation and it gives me an opportunity to signify uh, my tremendous uh, pleasure and appreciation for the years that you've spent as president of our said court and the time and the energy and the devotion that you've given to that position and the tremendous work you've done for the city of Salem and we're going to be missing you very much. But thank you. Thank you. I have a proclamation. Somebody must have thought ahead on this. I think so. All right. National Manufacturing Day proclamation. Whereas manufacturing is a critical component of our local economy, it pays a living wage and represents approximately 7% of Salem's economy. Whereas some of the region's highest paying jobs are in the manufacturing sector, and one manufacturing job typically creates four additional related jobs in our economy. And whereas innovations in manufacturing have resulted in niche markets for Salem's strong economic base in food processing, metal fabrication, medical device manufacturing, and avionics. And whereas we aim to raise awareness of manufacturing and high-skilled, high-wage jobs available in our community and the products they create, whereas filling these jobs with the next generation is key to maintaining the critical role <coughs> manufacturing plays in our regional economy, and whereas products manufactured in Salem are exported and enjoyed around the globe, including gourmet potato chips, organic apple cider, clean burning biodiesel fuel and solar ignits, a key component in solar panels. And whereas communities all across America are celebrating National Manufacturing Day on October 5th, 2012. Now therefore, be it resolved that I, Anna Peterson, Mayor of Salem, proclaim National Manufacturing Day October 5th, 2012. And I encourage all residents to learn more about a product that is made in Salem and to purchase locally made goods when possible. Thank you, Mayor. You're very welcome. And I'd like to present this to you. This is the proclamation. And there you are. Would you like to say a couple words about that? Well, it's, it's very nice. And thank you very much, Mayor. And uh, manufacturing is the key to the success of our local economy. And uh, whether it's food processing, value-added agriculture, or uh, you know, high-tech high manufacturing, it really does drive our, our economy. So you're exactly right. Um, I think 7% uh, is a kind of a low number, but I, I think maybe it's a little larger than that um, if you take all the forms of manufacturing that go on here in the Valley. We have a very diverse economy, uh, a lot of great companies that are here doing great jobs, and as you said, shipping product around the world. So congratulations to Salem. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. All right. 
right, I'm gonna move to council comments. Do we have counselors with comments this evening? Yes, uh, Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have two items real quick. Um, attended the uh, poverty simulation at Western Oregon University uh, a couple weeks ago. And as a grandfather disabled with two young children, I was given, we were all given scripts about what it's like, what families and folks on fixed incomes or minimal incomes, really, are facing. And I will tell you, it was a real eye-opener for me to see what, uh, the room was filled with about 100 people and we were in groups of four, so we were in families and I was a grandpa and I was given slips of paper about what my bills were each month and how much money I had coming in and, and how hard it was to get uh, social services, really just connected with social services. And the thing that became most, uh, became a real uh, eye opener for me was we were allowed to sit in chairs, but when you get evicted from your home uh, for late rent payment, the chairs are turned upside down. So we spent the balance of the whole simulation exercise standing up and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it, and that was just play. That was just pretend, but I will tell you that uh, the, just the awareness of what folks going through earning minimal wage or no wage, uh, particularly uh, with young kids around, just um, an absolute eye-opener. So everything anybody can do to support um, our social service agencies and uh, folks in need, um, boy, there's a lot of people hurting, and I think the simulation was run in conjunction with Polk County, Western Oregon University, and a number of other state agencies. The uh, Oregon's First Lady was there, Sylvia Hayes, and so, who's experienced uh, poverty. And so it was um, something that I hope that um, it, as they do some more of these simulations that more of us become involved with, because uh, I, I didn't know what networks existed out there and where some of the connections work and where some of them don't. So the other thing I wanted to bring up was I'm just hoping that uh, in the future when we allow for uh, large music events in our parks um, that we, you know, we issue permit, we take permit fees, and then essentially, unless there's a need to, uh, staff, city staff aren't there. We had, a, we had an event in Riverfront Park here the, oh, 10 days ago or something like that. And the entire West Salem heard all six hours of it. It was so loud, I thought it was happening in my yard. So I'm just hoping that in the future when we have noise events, um, that we sort of respect all the residents. Um, regardless of where they're at and sort of regulate those a little bit better. So I'm hoping uh, council will, will take a little bit tougher policy on some of the noise events. Uh, we have a good noise ordinance, we have good controls in a number of things, but uh, for some of the larger venues, um, I look forward to uh, working with staff to trying to clean that up a little bit. It, the entire side of, <laughs> I don't know about other parts of Salem, but boy, it sure felt like it was in our backyard. So I look forward to working with staff and other, with you guys in terms of making sure we've got a good noise ordinance, because what sounds like 50 decibels from here to there can sound like 200 decibels um, a quarter of a mile away. So uh, noise like beauty is relative, so. Right, um, I appreciate your comment, uh, Councillor Clem, and I too, expressed uh, my concern to staff following the event and following the complaints that I received. And I'd like to ask uh, City Manager Linda Norris, I know they've been uh, doing some research and maybe this will be a moment to just take time and explain what staff is doing and that you maybe perhaps will come back to us with more information. That's, that's right, we're still um, putting together protocols, different protocols to ensure this doesn't happen again. And Brady Rogers here and is coming to the microphone and so I think he'd like to tell you what he's learned and the steps we'll be taking. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. My name is Brady Rogers. I'm the Administrator of the Neighborhood Enhancement Division. The uh, uh, permits that are issued for the um, Concerts in the parks are uh, done by the Public Works Parks Department, but they work with us and we review the um, applications and set the levels. This one event was sort of a perfect storm in that the applicant had already had three successful uh, events at, at the Riverfront Park already, came off without a hitch, 
wanted to come in and do a fourth one. Um, things were going well at the last minute. He had to get a new sound engineer. And um, this sound engineer, instead of hanging the speakers and sort of angling them down into the crowd to keep the sound localized in the park, sort of set them up in a stack at the top of a, the downhill slope. And although there at the scene, if you'd have had a noise meter, it would have registered the correct decibels, most of the noise was actually, in fact, going over the heads of the people there in the park and across the river and into the hills in West Salem. And so it was um, sort of a, an accident that happened um, because of human frailty, uh, somebody that we had trusted, somebody who had done good shows in the past. And um, we've already been speaking with Parks and we'll be out to eyeball the um, speaker placement in the future before, before these events begin. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. And I uh, certainly do think, do encourage staff to produce a protocol that will provide for a way to remedy the situation as quickly as it's being reported when the numbers of complaints, as many as we were receiving, are received rather than having to wait until a day, two, three, four days later, and then we're all just saying, I'm sorry. But to be able to intervene more quickly, I think will make a huge difference. So I appreciate the staff uh, getting on it right away. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Councillor Tesler had her hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment that a couple of years ago we had a similar problem with a concert in the park and um, I believe, well, I live in the south and I remember sitting in my backyard and it was like the concert was right there <laughs> in the backyard. I mean, you couldn't close the windows, you couldn't get away. And so um, I remember a lot of people were pretty upset about that, um, including me, because my kid was up all night. But, um, you know, I, I just would encourage, you know, when this happens to avoid the knee jerk, you know, reaction and just kind of, you know, it was a foible. Um, it was a sound engineering issue. We've had a lot of other concerts in the park. Um, I don't want to see us, you know, muffle that or reduce those events because I think those events are really important to having our vibrant downtown and to people coming downtown and enjoying these musical events. And I've been to several um, this summer and I've noticed the speaker configuration has changed over time. And so I think maybe next time when we have this kind of thing, um, there would be a number or a phone tree or something where you know somebody's getting complaints at the non-emergency police number i would imagine and they could call the person you know who's on duty for that and then we could kind of take care of it from there i know that that's annoying so um but i just want to not see concerts be reduced or you know new ordinances happen that would constrict those type of entertainment activities downtown that's the only thing i would shy away from on that I believe Councillor uh, Blasey had her hand up. No? Yeah. All right, Councillor Nankey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, two things, first and foremost, on behalf of everyone who drives down McGilchrist, thank you to Public Works uh, for filling the two potholes at the end of 19th. <laughs> <clears throat> Wonderful. I, everybody doesn't have to go like this now and actually go into 19th a little bit as cars are pulling out. So that was a wonderful thing. Uh, secondly, wanted to just let everyone know that League of Oregon City's annual conference uh, is at the end of the week. Uh, they'll be doing tours of Salem and the surrounding area on Thursday, uh, and then standard conference uh, type presentations, uh, seminars, and uh, what have you on Friday and Saturday. So if you come upon mayors, councilors, uh, administrators and, and other public officials from other cities around Oregon, please make them feel welcome. Great idea. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clausen. Just a quick one. Uh, we now have a two-time world champion tennis player who used to sit in Councillor Tesler's seat. Paul Wolf just got back from Croatia representing the United States on the tennis team for the International Tennis Federation, I believe is who it's through. And, uh, so anyway, that's two years in a row now. So he's back in the in town. So if you see him around, tell him congratulations. Wonderful. All right. And thinking of your family, I'm not sure if we formally acknowledge the birth of your son. 
Yes, would you like to talk about your son? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, that too, you know. He's a week, he's a month old now, so you know, it's kind of old news, but. <laughs> oh, he's doing great. Mom's doing great, and big brother and sister. Are, well, Liam took a little while to get used to him and look at him, you know, but <laughs> doing good now, so everything's good at home. That's wonderful. And his name is? Luke. Luke. Oh, good. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Now, I think he is our first council baby. Uh, Maybe? Councilor Sullivan. Yeah. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. Well, then our second council baby. Did another councilor want to make comment? No? All right. We're going to go back up on our agenda to the um, actual approval of the additions and deletions to the agenda. So, Councilor Nanke, would you like to introduce that, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I would move uh, additions and deletions, and in uh, that motion uh, would be inherent that uh, the addition of item 10-1A, Mayor's item, uh, would be also approving to waiving the council rules to allow a, uh, an item on the agenda. Um, past the deadline of Thursday of last week. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Nanke and seconded by Councillor Tesler to accept the um, additions to the uh, council agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh -huh. We do have public Very comment careful. this evening, and we have a couple of people who've signed up for that. Uh, Lowell Ford, and then Scott, is it Bartlett? Or maybe Scott Bassett? Yes. All right, thank you. Mr. Ford? Thank you. Um, I'm Lowell Ford, and I live at 2450 Wallace Road in West Salem. And I'm here to speak on item 7F. And um, I have uh, given the same uh, information to the committee that was studying the Salem Crossing, the new bridge. And uh, unfortunately, um, I didn't make a big enough impact. And they are recommending item 4D, which I oppose. And the reason I oppose it is this, that first of all, it does not take into uh, consideration the studies that done by the city of Salem when it uh, first planned Marine Drive, which was to go to Riverbend Road and then join Wallace Road at the light. What 4D does do, it cuts our farm in two. It um, literally separates the upper 12 acres from the bottom 100 acres. Um, this should concern you because the road as it is planned right there uh, actually goes over directly over the sewer line which connects West Salem to Willow Lake. It also it happens to impact me. I, I spent uh, about five years working on a wetlands restoration uh, with the uh, State uh, D Department of uh, Lands and I established a four acre wetlands and that would be right directly where that road is to go. Now, I'm no Pollyanna. I've served on a planning commission in Polk County, and I know that when the urban growth boundary was put in there, I knew that at some point in time, it would impact our family. Uh, I'm just not real excited about the impact and the intrusiveness of that impact. Um, so I did take the time to look up with the uh, state how much they had planned to reimburse for cutting our farm in half and it's $50,000. Mm. Um, I tell you, for, for a farm that's been in the family for 68 years, I find that offensive. But um, and as you might guess as an individual. Um, so I would highly recommend the city council at least say, please consider how it impacts the individual. Things should be worked out, and it should be consistent with earlier studies done by the, uh, Salem. Um, I just ask, please consider the individual. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there questions from counselors? I believe uh, Councillor Dickey and then Councillor Nanke. 
Great. Thanks for um, coming down and sharing that. Um, I do have a question. Um, we have quite still a long process to go before any one particular alternative would be decided on, and then a lengthy process to determine if there's even you know funding to go ahead with it. Um, if there was an alternative chosen that would do just what you said, cut your farm in half, um, but with the idea that it could be years before the funding is ever identified for that or we'd have the money for that. Would that at all impact your activities on your farm on that property while it's just waiting kind of in that nebulous Limbo. waiting time? Yes. No, it would not impact the, uh, I have a vineyard on the, the upper portion and we have uh, uh, on the lower portion is uh, nursery stock raised and then we have some down below that's just in, in wetlands and in um, undeveloped property that will never be developed, it's just habitat. Uh, Councillor Nanke, did you have a question? Uh, more so just a comment in respect to this was just an information item come tonight. We have a public hearing coming up on November 5th, so I wanted to encourage you to actually get your comments on the record on the 5th as well. I've um, been encouraged, I've been given that. Excellent. <laughs> My, uh, I've been speaking up all along. But yeah, I just want to make sure you were aware that the public hearing November will be fifth. I hope our harvest is done by that time, uh, and I'll have the have our chance to come in. We could come out and help a little bit during I, the day. I so would appreciate it. Up a bit <laughs> Please come with clean feet. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. We do appreciate you coming and talking with us this evening. Thank you. Now, I believe the next person, Scott, is it Bassett? Yes. Thank you. All right. Good. My name is Scott Bassett, mm -hmm. and I'm from uh, Ward 4, and um, uh, Mayor and Councilors, I appreciate the chance to, to comment briefly about, uh, about the third bridge. Um, the last time that that was addressed, uh, that received action in front of the City Council was uh, in 2010, and that's when you increased the project's budget from $2 million to $5 million. Um, the project is six years from the, when it started and four years late. So, uh, Councillor Dickey, when you talk about this may take a while, six years already, two years to get through the approval process, five years to build, and in the meantime, city staff have tried hard to um, get the existing bridge to work um, as best it can. Signals are optimized, but I would encourage you since we're in a holding pattern for so long to move forward some projects that are calling out to be done. On the front page of my handout, I list eight options. In summary, you have about four lanes across the bridge. You have eight lanes out there, and they're just not used very well. Um, speed is, is posted, and uh, for those peak hours, it's a problem. In summary, what, what would be really helpful would be to have two additional on-ramps and two additional off-ramps that aren't controlled by a light. They're free flow on, free flow off. First one is Marine Drive uh, connection from Center Street. The studies have said it's 25 to 30 percent increase in capacity of the bridge. It was included in 2B that you'll hear about later, and yet ODOT uh, um, has some concerns about doing that um, as an alternative to Wallace. But, you know, having spent some time in West Salem, it, it seems to me that Wallace Road and Glen Creek are the bottleneck. And in the afternoon, the lights, um, which are flashing here, um, <laughs> the lights stop traffic and back them all the way up the parkway. And uh, in the mornings, uh, you could have an off-ramp from Center Street Bridge to Front Street Bridge without stopping. Soon as you, and then you'd, end, you'd land on the left-hand lane of Front Street. Um, soon as you pass the Gilbert House, you would go left on an off-ramp. Just like there's an off-ramp going to the south, you'd have an off-ramp going to the north. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are other uh, items on this list. Um, past studies have concluded that uh, there wasn't money available and there weren't satisfactory options. Your task force that's come up with split and so there really isn't a consensus that uh, a lot of us would, had hoped would be built on the third bridge. Uh, and, uh, 
And so since it's going to be so long, it would be nice to set in motion some less expensive options that uh, would um, help use the existing bridge lanes better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Mr. Bassett? We appreciate you coming down. appreciate your handouts. Thank you. All right. We are now at the consent calendar. Councillor Nanke, would you like to make a motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would move the, uh, the consent calendar. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Nanke, seconded by Councillor Tesler to adopt the consent calendar as presented. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. We will now move to um, information reports. If there are questions about those, let's see if that's the right place we are. Yes, because we have no public hearings, we have no special orders of business, and we have no unfinished business. There were several information reports in your packet. Um, Councillor uh, Clausen, did you have a question? I do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My question is about item 7D, which is the planning administrator decision having to do with the Peck Trust property down off okay. of Kubler. Mm -hmm. um, I had a great opportunity to talk with uh, Public Works Director Fernandez and um, was it Glenn Davis, I think? And uh, this afternoon, and I had some good questions answered. There was one question that I had forgotten about, and I was driving while I was talking to him on Bluetooth, not on oh, my handset. All right. <laughs> uh, and the question was one of the conditions, condition number nine, I believe it is. Uh, well, and actually to orient everybody, if I could, for just a quick second. Pack Trust is one of our biggest developments we have going on in Salem right now, in South Salem, right off of Kubler and Battle Creek. And uh, a ton of dirt work is going on out there. And um, Public Works has been great responding to some dust complaints from neighbors and such, which was really good. And um, the conditions that have come through are on this first phase of development in which we're getting some commercial space. and. Uh, I believe a building for Salem Clinic is what the plan is. And the questions that I have come up with are what conditions are being placed on this first phase of development versus the entirety of the development. And I had a lot of good questions answered. My biggest one, and I guess for Director Fernandez, um, is the <coughs> condition number nine. It's talking about a deferral statement and it makes it sound to me like none of these conditions are going to be implemented until phase two comes through. It says, as a condition of building permit issuances for that first building of UGA phase two, complete the re remaining. Right, Councillor Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. I think, I think the key word there is the first building of phase two. Okay. So it, I, I believe what that condition says is uh, once they proceed beyond the Salem Clinic building and the other small building in phase one, then uh, upon uh, pulling the first building permit for anything else on the site, they're going to build everything else that right. they're required to build. I apologize. I said the wrong condition number. Condition number 10. Oh, okay. It says prior to issuing the first permit for phase one, there's going to be a deferral agreement for one, two, three, four, and nine. So it sounds like one, two, three, four, and nine are going to be deferred before we issue a permit for phase one. And one, two, three, four, and nine are one of the most, some of the most critical developments for the upfront portion on the streets. So we would get no improvements to Boone, we'd get no improvements to Battle Creek, we'd have no improvements at all to infrastructure if we we're able to defer those. Let's see if one of the Glens can <laughs> answer that. That's not the Sorry. intent, but let's no, I, I appreciate that question. I didn't mean to question. get that in depth. I wish I could have remembered my <laughs> question while we were talking yeah, earlier that, today. That's fine. That's not the intent, so we'll see if. Mm -hmm. Is there okay. prepping for that, Madam Mayor, yes. if I may? Uh -huh. And several of the councilors and the mayor weren't here when we had a lot of the discussions on this piece of property, so it'd be nice just to kind of let people know what improvements will happen. Certainly. And kind of when if we have any 
uh, certainly time frame with so the so the the pack trust property is the uh, is the southeast corner of uh, Kubler and Battle Creek and it's bounded on the south by Boone Road and on the east by 27th Avenue. Uh, it is a substantial improvement that will include uh, a couple of office buildings, a couple of, uh, of retail buildings, and then, and, then a, and then a substantial large shopping center. Uh, it was the subject of a zone change and a comprehensive plan change a number of years ago. And as a part of that, uh, there are a number of conditions related to street improvements that include uh, the widening of Kubler Boulevard from where uh, the, the eastbound Kubler Boulevard, where it ends at uh, Commercial Street all the way to I-5. Uh, as part of that condition, the, uh, the developer gets to put in a right turn in into the site. There are also improvements uh, to 27th, to Boone, to Battle Creek. Uh, there are new signals uh, at, uh, at a number of those intersections that they have to, they have to put in. So there's a, there's a whole host of, of transportation improvements to support uh, the development of this, uh, of this property and to mitigate the impacts of the development of this property on the, on the transportation system. What you have before you is a site plan approval for uh, the first phase, they needed to move forward with the Salem Clinic building. And so the, generally the improvements are those that bound the southwest corner of the property, uh, which is this, where the Salem Clinic building and the other commercial building are going to be, so that they're, the improvements to Boone and the improvements to Battle Creek are conditions of this first phase of development, uh, but not the signal improvements and not Kubler. Nothing so I think with that, Mr. Davis is going to tell us what those other conditions mean, what the deferral agreement means. And, and Glenn Davis, Chief Development Engineer, the Public Works Department. The, the deferral agreement is uh, formalizing all the zone change conditions that were approved before and placing them in, in, a, in a document that's going to be recorded against the property so the property owner is obligated to construct the remainder of the improvements. Uh, what it's talking about here is the, the, uh, the trigger of the improvement is for this, what's called UGA phase one. This, this app, this, the first project triggers the improvement. And so the deferral agreement with the, those initial improvements for UGA phase one uh, will include those that are being built with the first phase which is really one through four on that list. And the number nine is the one that's coming later. And so everything else is in the deferral agreement. So the, the intent of the language oh, is that it's saying, what are the items that are being built now in one through four? And then what's the item in number nine being built later? OK, I understand. So to clarify, just make sure I've got it in my head. So one, two, three, four, and nine in the deferral agreement will say we're building these parts now mm -hmm. and then the rest which would be the south side of Kubler and so on and so forth will be deferred until phase two and or the future UGA development phase. Yes sir. Okay I understand thank you that <coughs> makes a lot more sense to me now. Okay. Were there other counselors with questions on this? Uh, Councillor Clem and then Councillor Blasey. Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, I followed the the question and the answer. I'm just not sure 10 says that. Um, it says we shall sign an improvement deferral agreement, which then specifies the terms of the deferral. So uh, we're putting it on the record here that staff intends that those conditions in one, two, three, and four that to be deferred are only those relative to phase two. Is that correct? Yes, if I could, uh, Glenn Gross, Planning Administrator. The key to Condition 10, and perhaps it could be worded better, but the key to that, the intent of that is just to clarify that before <coughs> any permit can be issued for anything, we need that deferral agreement signed and recorded. The deferral agreement then will specify what gets built with this first phase and what can be deferred until the second phase. So. The intent there was just to clarify that before any building permit is issued, we need the deferral agreement signed and recorded. So what's being deferred? What's being deferred is all of the conditions, street improvements and utility conditions that were imposed at the original zone change, all of those except for the ones that are needed to mitigate the impact of the two office 
uh, projects that are going forward in phase one. So those necessary improvements related to that amount of additional traffic flow. Exactly. When, when the zone change was originally approved, uh, it wasn't anticipated that this project would be built in phases. It was assumed that the whole major retail shopping center and all of the outbuildings and so forth would come in as a single project. And so consequently, a list of many improvements were, were attached to the, uh, to the zone change as a condition of approval, including the improvement of Kubler all the way from um, I-5 to commercial. Um, but now we're having this first phase with just two uh, medical offices. It wouldn't be reasonable to impose all of that uh, improvements on this pro on this project is not proportional. So what's being done is deferring a lot of the improvements that will be necessary to accommodate the retail development, which will come at some later date. Defer that, but require the improvements that are necessary to impact the actual impact of the uh, the first phase project. Is is this discussion weighty enough to be considered? the city's intent in terms of making this proportional in terms of further land use matters? Question for the city attorney. Is this enough with all this verbal stuff to make it very clear that it's proportional to only phase one? I, I think given that this is an informational item, then I would not say that that's true. Okay. Councilor Blasey. Yes. Um, I, have, I do have a question before you leave. <laughs> Another question. So I guess a uh, larger picture, um, you know, that's a, I'm, I'm already getting lots of calls. Bigger picture going from Kubler all the way, from commercial all the way down Kubler, you know, we widened uh, the inbound lanes. We still have one lane going all the way from commercial to I-5, which I know everyone knows. But, but there's a lot of questions, and what's, the questions that are coming up now are, we're adding more business out there. We've asked them, you know, through this plan to address the issue through a turn lane, but I guess bigger picture question is, what, is, what do you know about, uh, about Kubler from commercial all the way to I-5? Big picture, because yeah. if we're adding more business out there and we're putting in a turn lane, you know, I and just to tell you, I was I was telling someone else, you know, coming home on Friday, getting off there, and getting up to commercial. I saw people making U-turns on Kubler to turn around and go back because the traffic was backed up all the way from I-5 to commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, miles and miles. So now we're putting in additional business with a right turn lane. So what is what's mm -hmm. the big picture plan? So, so when when Pack Trust proposed this development. We had, we actually had money at the same time to do the project that we built at the westbound lane. Uh, we actually thought at one point that Pack Trust was going to build faster or, or we would have partnered with Pack Trust to do the whole thing. That was right about the time when the economic debacle took place and, you know, the bottom fell out of retail development. So Pack Trust actually has now lagged for several years beyond that. So we're well aware that we built the westbound and then uh, uh, west of Liberty, we actually have built those other improvements. So this is, this is what's left. Uh, because it is a requirement of PAC trust, we have never funded it with city dollars or, or ODOT uh, dollars to, to build that piece. Uh, we have put Pack Trust on notice. In fact, we've talked to Pack Trust. We we speak to them all the time, but we put them on notice a couple of years ago that once we are done with our uh, uh, projects, our bond projects, and there are going to be savings, that we would have to have the conversation of whether they in fact are going to build the road, regardless of whether they are ready to build their shopping center or not. Uh, because we need to get that improvement built and we would have to propose it with some of the savings. They are aware what they have uh, indicated to us is they will be ready to speak to us and will be w ready to at least consider putting in that improvement whether 
the shopping center is ready to go or not. The unfortunate, so that's good news. The unfortunate part is that we're still, you know, several years away from, from putting it in. The, the, the right turn lane that we speak of uh, really has to do with access into the site. So uh, all of Kubler would be widened. So we would have two lanes eastbound from where it ends just uh, east of commercial all the way to I-5 and then at the site there would then be a right turn lane with a right turn in in addition to, so there'd be a, there'd be a third drop lane into, into the site. Our sense is that that's an important, that PAC Trust recognizes the importance. We feel given the difficulty of getting in and out of that site that it's important to uh, minimize the impacts of the neighborhood to have that, that lane in there. The concern that we had with this first phase is that uh, they are not taking access from Kubler for this first phase for the, the, the small medical office building and it just didn't meet any kind of proportionality requirements to force them to do Kubler with this first phase. So that's why what you see is a piece of the Boone Road and a piece of the Battle Creek improvements. So can I clarify, the, sorry, can I clarify then that the agreement, the understanding at this point with them is that they would make the improvement from all the way from Oh yes. Commercial to I five. Oh yes, that is that is in. It's, it's more than a, it's it's more than an agreement. That is their requirement as part of their zone change. And when we write it into this agreement, that's exactly what it will say. So there's no question that Pact Trust is required to do it. Uh, the only the only thing that's in question is timing. You know, if if they can land, and I know they've worked very hard looking for tenants. Uh, if they're able to find tenants. Uh, quickly, they will build uh, that shopping center and they will put in uh, the Kubler Boulevard improvements. So the, the only issue is if they can't find tenants between now and 2015 when our projects are done, then I think it's incumbent upon the staff to have the conversation with council as to whether, you know, do we move that project forward or not move that project forward. That's a very good comment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Just a general comment to this. One, one good thing that Councillor Blazy is bringing up, I'm glad to hear that Ward 7 is interested in this too, because I know Ward 4 is very interested in this, because <laughs> this kills us trying to get to I-5 in the morning. It can be really bad. And 3 as well. <laughs> so anyway, this is a big deal for South Salem, and I know Kubler is slated to be one of our busiest streets here within <coughs> the next 15 years. So. Um, one interesting thing and a good thing is we do have a condition in here that they've got to provide a right turn lane from eastbound Kubler onto Battle Creek. So th it will help with some of the traffic that's generated by those new buildings to go in there. I think that will help to ease some of the issues on, ba on Kubler because really where it stacks up is Kubler and Battle Creek. Once you get past there, it's free sale and almost to I-5. So I'm hoping that right turn might take some of those cars out of the stack. So, you know. It's kind of a band-aid on a larger issue that just we need to finish Kubler. Councillor Clem. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Peter, just um, we're, we're putting $18 million into the Kubler interchange, Kubler I-5 interchange. What's the timing of that like related to potentially the timing of the bond money and the timing of the pack trust development. Well, I know ODOT's underway with uh, with some of their design. In fact, we've had the call that we need to start looking at moving one of our water lines that's underneath the uh, the ramp. Uh, that's Those are ramp improvements. So that will help uh, with uh, the signal system at the interchange. It will, it will relieve some of that. Uh, I don't have a the timing on it, it's probably about the same time as we'd have, be having these discussions sort of in terms of construction. So, the next biennium? From construction, okay. So, okay, so. Is it possible that in a future uh, update to the TSP or anything like that, you can give us sort of a what's all happening with Kubler in the next? Oh, 10 sure. Years? We'll just we'll, we'll just send you we'll send you an email with the uh, with the details. I, it, it's it's an unfortunate situation. I mean, we have we have private developer dollars, which are usually good news to build this. It's just that the economy went bad and. The, the, the community was able to build all of its pieces first and this one's just lagged a little bit and and that's you know it looks it's it's a tough situation and it looks foolish but we're just kind of stuck 
right at the moment. Councillor Nanke. Thank you very much. Just knowing that there's a large community uh, concern in regards to set traffic, can we get that as potentially just an uh, uh, information item so yes. we can pass that along to constituents rather than an email? Yes, yeah. we'll do that. That way everybody <laughs> knows where to yeah, point to. No problem. Okay, yeah, good. Good point. All right, thank you. Other uh, councillor uh, questions or discussion regarding information reports? Councillor Dickey. Thank you, Mayor. I um, do have a couple questions on the 7F, the river crossing um, report. So um, first, I want to thank staff for bringing that back so quickly. It's just been a few weeks since we asked for that. So um, thanks for getting that information quickly. Um, a couple of things I'm curious about um, as we're looking at the timeline, and I know there's a lot of agencies involved. Um, if we know what the timeline is for other agencies making a recommendation, um, and I know that the oversight team um, had um, target for agencies, but is there any sort of a deadline? So in other words, could an agency drag this out for months and months, or is there some sort of deadline for them to make their recommendation? Yeah, Councillor, thank you. There is, uh, there's no real deadline uh, on this thing. In fact, uh, what I'm understanding from Julie, and she can correct, she can jump up and correct me, is that, uh, is that most agencies are waiting for us to make the decision, is that correct? Okay, come to the... <laughs> Julie Warnicky will come to the microphone. Um, good evening, I'm Julie Warnicky, Transportation Planning Manager. Uh, the um, oversight team, when it met um, in August, the discussion was that it would probably make most sense for Salem to uh, make have their input first. However, each individual jurisdiction is also running their own process. So I can't guarantee that, but I know that there's an understanding that um, you know we want, you know, Salem has the biggest impact, direct impact from any of the alternatives. And so our input is important. So Yes, Councillor Dickey. Yeah, um, and I have another question too um, regarding if there's been any sort of cost benefit analysis done just in general for the project. Um, so, um, for example, and I don't even know that we could put a dollar amount on it because without having a preferred alternative, you know, the costs could vary significantly. Um, you know, Salem will get the biggest impact, will receive the biggest impact from this project, but the, uh, there are other jurisdictions that will receive benefit from it besides just Salem. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of breakout of that and um, to kind of go along with that. So we're doing a lot of work on this in the city. Um, and you know we're spending a lot of money to do the planning and um, a lot of this. Is there any sort of percentage to say maybe some county has maybe 10% vested interest in this because they'll get some sort of benefit out of it? Um, and you know are they coming along with their share of the um, the funds or the manpower or whatever it is that is needed at this time and into the future? Does that make sense? Yes, Councillor. Okay. Uh, the, 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 well, let, let me start by saying that the EIS process, and, and we should waive the volume one, the volume one and volume two, uh, is in essence, uh, you know, an analysis of, of, of environmental costs and benefits for, for the project. And that's what the federal EIS process is for. So that's kind of the, 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 the general. On the more specific, we have been in partner, to, more specific to, to your question, we have been in partnership uh, with the Oregon Department of Transportation and you know we have split the costs and the staffing of, uh, of this process with them. We could have allowed ODOT to do it. We don't feel that we would have been well represented if Julie Warnicke hadn't been in the trenches with uh, the ODOT staff so that our interests are well represented and she's done an excellent job along with the members of our committee. Uh, I think what you're, what you're speaking to is so now as we proceed and make a decision on what, uh, which alternative we want and how we're going to pay for it, I think you're absolutely right that we need to have that conversation with our partners to see how we're going to pay for this thing. And, uh, and it makes perfect sense that uh, the state be a partner, that the two counties be a partner, that cities around the community be a partner in, in the cost of, 
of design, right of way acquisition, and construction of this thing. So, so the way I see this unfolding is uh, you're going to have we're going to have a public hearing on uh, on November 5th, where the council will finally have an opportunity for for your constituents to speak to you directly. On, and this is right in the timeline. This is the first. This is the first appropriate opportunity for you to hear that. We are then. We're going to ask you to not make a decision immediately after the public hearing, so that we can engage you in a very detailed work session to discuss what the EIS says, what we've heard from your from our citizens, and then what is the best alternative that the council can coalesce around. To then, uh, once we once we have coalesced around an alternative, go and visit with our partners, Marion County, Polk County, City of Kaiser. Uh, I dare say that we should be speaking to Dallas and Monmouth and Independence and and many of the other communities, so that we can get a sense that everybody. I think it'd be important that all communities be on board with with the alternative that we've coalesced around, and then once we have a decision that we can all agree that it's. Alternative X is then have a very honest discussion about where is the money going to come from and how are how is how is this going to to be funded? I could foresee, and, and I'm doing a little speculating now, but I could foresee that you know we could go out for some form of bond issue or some form of funding that is almost like a Chemeketa Community College kind of thing, you know, over a three county area, or over a school district styled area, you know, something bigger than just Salem, because this, while we, while we gain uh, uh, a significant benefit by moving traffic away from downtown and giving our citizen of Salem another way uh, out, uh, in and out of West Salem, this is clearly a much more regional project than just a city project, and, and there's really no way that the city's gonna bear the only costs to, 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 to this project. Mm -hmm. Further questions or comments on that item? Uh, yes, uh, visiting Councillor Rebecca Engel, welcome. Um, I just wanted to know how the, since I was sitting on in some of those meetings, I mean, I was in some of those meetings and we, we came up with a, a vote at the end but I was just wondering, but there was no agreement actually on one thing at the end. Everyone voted for what, what they thought because there wasn't really looking like it was gonna to come to an agreement. So how is that gonna be presented like further from here on out? Is that going to be presented as the top two items are the recommendations or rather that all the items sort of like lined up, here's how the votes went down? Yeah, the, 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 we will report, in fact, I think the staff report speaks to, uh, yeah, it's attachment six, so mm -hmm. speaks to how that vote, that's all advisory mm -hmm. to the elected body, and the elected body can ultimately decide whatever it will decide. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, that's part of the, part of the process. And then, and then, and then whatever the, this city council decides, that is the uh, the alternative that that it wants to coalesce around. Then we're going to have to visit with the other elected bodies and see if we can come to agreement. So it's a very complex process. So it's not being stated as a recommend that there was a recommendation. Well, what is stated is how it how it there was a plurality okay. of of one versus the other, and the council has that information. Uh, so the council understands that that that's what the 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 groups that have been meeting came to uh you know the you know sorry. yes sorry <laughs> <laughs> Uh, may, 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 may I interrupt, um, Director I <laughs> Fernandez? Guess. I, I just wanted to clarify that um, there were there are two different groups that we're talking about here. So what you're referring to is the community task force, and so attachment six details the um, I guess you could say votes uh, the tally that was taken at the last meeting, um, but. After that, the project oversight team had a meeting, and that was the representatives from the uh, the elected representatives from the different jurisdictions, and they did make a recommendation for alternative 4D. Now, both of those, you know, if all of that information is being fed to council and to all the other jurisdictions. I just, sorry, I yeah, just that's okay. thought that was getting lost. That's okay. There. So it's so that's, <laughs> but 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 I think the point that that or the, your question is. The, does, does that have any formal weight? And the answer is it has the weight of telling 
this council and other elected bodies that these groups that have met for three years trying to decide that is their formal recommendation, but it is up to the council to then make the ultimate decision. Other comments or questions on that particular uh, um, information report? All right, thank you. I would like to make comment on um, one of the items in the information reports, and that's the um, 7E, the annual planning commission report to the city council. Um, I would just like to call everyone's attention uh, to the valuable work that our planning commission does and take a moment to reflect and, and say our appreciation to the members of the planning commission for their thoughtful work, their willingness to serve, and um, their willingness to bring to the council um, these important decisions that truly do drive and direct the city in the work that we're doing to um, truly build and make a better community for everyone. So I would just like to point that out. And the names of the commission members are on the uh, attachment A. And I'd like to recognize in our audience tonight is uh, Nate Levine here. I appreciate you coming, appreciate the work that you're doing, and um, wondered if you'd like to say a word or two about the Planning Commission. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate the reg recognition, and uh, there are uh, two of us that are, uh, Dark Oss and myself, will term out after eight years this December. So I uh, just uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at the, at the balances and the strengths and the, uh, and the direction that the Planning Commission can contribute. And uh, it's been a real pleasure serving. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we certainly do appreciate the, the service. And um, all of the members on the Planning Commission are highly valued by the city. Thank you very much. All right. Eight years begins to feel a little like indentured <laughs> servitude. <laughs> well, we really do appreciate the service. We truly do. All right. Uh, following information reports, we have ordinances. We have no first readings, but we will move to second readings. Would the recorder please introduce those? Ordinance Bill number 2312, relating to the abatement of dangerous buildings, repealing SRC 56200 through 56390, and creating new provisions, and amending SRC 56.001, 56.195, 20J.100, 160, 210, 220, and 230. Councillor Blasey? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Councillor Bennett is absent. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Ordinance Bill number 2512, designating the Heli House located at 3281 Croison Creek Road, South Salem, Oregon, as a local historic resource. Councillor Clem? Aye. Councillor Bennett is absent. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Blasey? Mayor Peterson. Aye. Ordinance Bill number 2612, designating the Nielsen House, located at 1677 High Street, Southeast Salem, Oregon, as a local historic resource. Councillor Bennett is absent. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Blasey? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Our next item of business would be public comment. I don't have anyone signed up. Is there anyone in the audience who came to testify this evening and was not able to sign up? All right. Then what we are going to do is to move to new business and a mayor's motion, which was um, in your packet of addendum materials. And I move to direct staff to prepare a resolution to transfer $5,000 from the general fund contingency to the Neighborhood Enhancement Trust Fund to be expended for the purpose of funding the Historic Residential Toolbox Grant Program. Second. It's been moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Tesler 
Thank you very much. And uh, by way of, of discussion, I'll tell you that um, in fiscal year 11-12, the city established the Historic Residential Toolbox Grant Program, and it provides grants to owners of historic properties to allow updates and repairs of their properties. The money has been fully expended, and it has resulted in 13 property owners upgrading their historic sites. These funds provide an economic incentive for the owners of historic properties who bear the burden of the expensive repairs. These properties are truly an asset to our entire community. The city has received an offer from an anonymous donor for a $5,000 gift to the Historic Residential Tool Grant Program, Toolbox Grant Program for fiscal year 12-13. The offer is contingent upon a match but from the city of $5,000, and without that money, there will be no funds this year um, in the program. So if passed, my motion would provide continued funding for the program, and I urge your, your approval of my motion. Are there questions? Further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Before I adjourn the meeting, I want to say to our guest counselor, Rebecca Engel, thank you so much for being with us this evening and for representing Ward 1. And I also wanted to take a few minutes to say thank you for all of the work you've done uh, on behalf of the Can Do Neighborhood Association. I think that's where we first met when I came to some of those meetings. And I know you've been a participant in other events and other um, efforts here at the city. I wanted to say thank you very much for that. Would you like to say a couple of words to us? Thanks for letting me sit in. <laughs> <laughs> We're very happy to have you here. And again, thanks for the thank work you. that you've done in our community. It's people like you, you that truly make our city hum. Thank you. All right, I see no uh, counselor items for us this evening. Counselor Nanke. Yeah, and, and as I read it, we mentioned it in pre-council today in regards to the November schedule. Yeah. Um, as far as staff bringing something forward for rules change to where we automatically have both November and December uh, schedules to the front end of the month so we don't have to deal with that and people know what our schedule is for that to stay away from the holidays. Okay. Right, so we will be meeting the first Monday the second Tuesday of November, because the first, the second Monday is a holiday, and then in December the first and second Mondays. That's correct? right. That's correct. All right, and those dates will be on our website. Thank you. Is there any further business? We are adjourned. Two executives. Two executives.